All right, so thanks for uh, coming to my session. Today we'll be uh, talking about Realm. It's a new object database uh, for Android, iOS, uh, React Native, and they're working on other bindings as well for other languages. Now, before I get going here, unfortunately, and fortunately, I guess, uh, on the schedule online, it's tagged with SQL. Um, there'll ab be absolutely zero SQL in this entire talk, but I imagine it was put there because it's a database, so it completely makes sense. Um, and I will kind of talk a little bit about differences of SQL and Realm. Um, so if you're here for SQL, I don't want to disappoint you, so I just want to let you know that there will be no SQL. Um, this is Android-based. Again, Realm works with iOS and Android, React Native, uh, and other bindings, but this is going to be completely around the Android implementation that I've worked with exclusively. Uh, but all of these concepts that you'll see here you can, be, can be applied to Swift or iOS or whatever if you're interested. Uh, and the last thing is, uh, Realm is a it's kind of a new thing. There's a lot of paradigm shifts that you have to think about in regards to how Realm works, why it works the way it does. So I am just going to ask that we hold the questions to the end because I have given this presentation a few times and when I do the questions in the middle, I always run way over and miss half the content and I don't want to do that. All right, so a little, about, a little bit about me. I've been in the software industry for close to 16 years now. Um, I am an Android Google developer expert. Uh, independent consultant for mobile and web, so I can, I've can i done iOS, I've done Android, I've done Rails and .NET and Ruby uh, and Node and so forth. I also run a video training website called caster.io, so if you're looking to learn a couple new things, Dagger, dependency injection, uh, all different kinds of things, MVP pattern, check it out. There's a few other Android GDEs that are on caster.io as well. I've written a few books on Android. I host a co-host a podcast that's on Android development, uh, and I've had a few very popular Android apps in the Google Play Store that are still currently in the top 100 free category. And finally, if you need to ask me a question, you can email me through my website at domfelker.com, but I probably won't reply to you very quickly, and it's not because I don't like you, it's just because I have too many emails in my inbox. So uh, I use Twitter as the forcing function. Uh, it's only 140 characters, so I can only use 140 characters, so I might as well reply to you right away. Um, so if you need to ask a quick question, Ping me there, uh, it's probably the best way. If you need longer form, feel free to send an email, it just may be a little bit slower getting back to you. So let's hop into it real quick. What is Realm? It's basically just a brand new object database, brand new mobile database really. And if we think about where, what we, anytime you have a like Android, iOS, anything like that, and you wanna write data to a database, immediately the first thing that comes to your mind is, I'm gonna use SQLite, because that's pretty much the only option. Sure, you can write things to you know an XML file, a JSON file, and we've all done that, but if you want real database support, you end up relying on SQLite. Now, Realm is something completely brand new. It's written from the ground up in C++. Um, Realm is actually headquartered uh, in Denmark. It's actually a, a Danish company. They have offices in San Francisco, uh, and I've been consulting with them for about six months, kind of helping with documentation uh, and some small development here and there. And so I kind of have a little bit of a deeper understanding with it, which is one of the reasons why I'm here today. That said, uh, again, we did have the SQL tag on the schedule. This uh, it has no SQL in it whatsoever. It's not a fork of SQLite. Uh, there's no SQLite, SQL engine in, in it whatsoever. It's a completely new engine completely. So I think the best way to understand it is let's take a look at a simple object. Again, this is Java here. So it's a plain old Java object. It's a POJO. Uh, and we have a Let's assume we want to save a bunch of dogs to your database because maybe you're creating a dog tracking application or whatever. Uh, the only thing we have to do here is extend Realm object. And that basically says, hey, Realm, and Realm's a database, hey, Realm, we want to be able to save this object. There's a couple of annotations I've used here that are probably very familiar and self-explanatory. The primary key basically says that this is a unique value that has to be stored in this integer. Primary keys don't have to be integers. They can be strings. They can be longs. They can be a number of things. Uh, here we're just using an integer. Uh, and then we also have the name is required, so the name can't be null. Uh, and then we have the age, which will just default to the regular value of zero if it's not provided. That basically tells Realm, hey, look, this is an object that we can store in Realm, and that's pretty much it. I just left out the getters and setters. You'll see this line probably all over the place. It's just to save space on the screen, but we have the normal getters and setters in there as well. If we want to take that dog object and we want to save it to the database, it's actually pretty easy. We just kind of create a new instance of the dog object, and then we create basically ask Realm, say, hey, give me the default instance of Realm. It's, we're basically opening the database connection. And that's here, getting a Realm instance. And then we say, I want to persist it uh, locally. And we say, all right, we want to begin a transaction. We want to copy this dog object to Realm. So save it to the database and then commit it. And as soon as the commit line is hit, 
we now have that dog in the database. So now it's saved. So I don't have to write any SQL. I don't have to do anything like that. I've just taken a, an object, extended a class, and told Realm to just save it. Now it's in my database and I can query for it. That's one way we can save. The other way to save, which is, again, let me go back real quick. Uh, this is one way to save. Uh, and we have a copy to Realm here. Now this might be very useful if you're consuming a REST API endpoint and you're using Realm as a local cache and you need to save like 500 objects to a cache, a local cache so it can, you know, survive offline or whatever. You can use copy to Realm here. It'll actually take a list of objects uh, that you've created and you can dump it directly right into Realm and it will save all 500 objects like that. So it's very easy to use this kind of saving mechanism here to save large chunks of data, either individual or you can use a list. And we'll talk about lists in a second. The second way to save objects, uh, which is very common as well, is to just open your database using the get default instance. Uh, then we open a transaction by calling get transaction. And then we call, we say, Realm, say, hey, Realm, go ahead and create an object for me. Create something in the database. And it's going to create a new dog object for us. We pass in what type of object we want. And then we can set the name like Rex and the age of one. Uh, and actually that is a typo. That should not be a string. That should be age one uh, without the quotes. That is my mistake. And then we hit commit transaction. At that point, our dog is now inside of the database. So a couple different ways to save objects. Now you notice we've used transactions before. This is what we just saw a second is the basic transaction support. We're just kind of a manual transaction. We're telling Realm we want to start it. We do some work in the middle. Uh, for example, we're going to do some querying, which we'll talk about querying in a second. We set the age, we commit the transaction, and if for some reason an error occurs, I'll need, if I want to roll, roll it back, roll back any of those changes, I just call realm.cancel transaction and all the data is rolled back. The data is consistent in the database, nothing's too funky at all. And so I can kind of do anything like that. That's one way to handle a transaction. The other way is through a transaction block, and usually this is the way that I recommend you do it, because we just tell realm to execute a transaction, pass it a new instance of one, I can inline it here or pass in an instance of transaction. And then, uh, as you notice, I'm just doing the work in here. And uh, I'm going to query the data database here. And again, we're going to talk about querying and on the next slide. And we're just going to find the dog that has a name equal to Fido, find the first one, and then I want to set his age to 15. Notice I'm not calling the begin transaction and commit transaction at all. Begin is called before we get here. Commit is called right after we, we pop through. If for any reason an exception occurs in the execute, method here, the transaction will be rolled back. So what it allows you to do is make sure that you're actually calling begin, commit, and cancel properly without having to worry about it whatsoever. So I recommend you use this. Again, if you don't want to, you can also use this method here. Uh, either one's up to you. It's just this is the recommended one here. Okay, so I talk about querying. Let's talk a little bit more uh, about this. Uh, we're gonna open the database again. We wanna be able to get some data out of the database. How do we do that? Well. What we can do is we have something here on the left. We're getting some puppies here, and we just want to query the database to find any dog that's less than the age of two. Now, notice we have realm results of dog. Realm results is just a list of T. For those familiar with Java, it's just a list of T. Realm results is just a hyped up list that has a bunch of extra cool things about it, which we're going to talk about here uh, in the next few slides. But just know that it's a list of T. And so what we can do is just query uh, using this interface where the dog class less than the age of two and find all of them. That's going to give me all my objects back. And if I've saved one already, uh, then I can just see that the size, again, using the list interface is equal to one. Now, here's a cool thing though. This is, uh, this is really easy. What we can also do is we can also start chaining our calls together using a fluent interface. So maybe now I want to find all the dogs whose name are Fido or Snoopy. So I can start chaining these calls together here, which is really nice. It's really easy to use. Uh, if you've written any SQL before, you've known you have to kind of hop in and write a bunch of join statements and all different kinds of stuff like that. Using the Fluent interface makes it super simple um, where I really don't have to do much other than write typical Java. And again, this does the same thing here, just finding any dog that is named Fido or Snoopy and giving them all back to me, so pretty easy. There's various other qu query uh, modifiers in here as well. So all the ones that are pretty self-explanatory, you're probably used to seeing yourself, like the between, less than, begins with, ends with. Uh, so a whole bunch of them inside of here that you can use uh, inside of Realm. Now, at this point, usually when uh, there's a lot of questions being asked, people ask, well, what about relationships? This object contains this other object. How does that model? Well, it's actually pretty easy. So we have another class here as an example. This is a person object. And we have, they have a first and a last name and whatever else. But maybe this person also has some dogs. So uh, we want to be able to make sure that they have some dogs. And we just use something called a Realm list. Again, this 
instance, a realm list is just an abstraction uh, that's on top of list of t. So it's just a realm list. And this basically tells realm that, hey, I want you to go ahead and store a list of dogs. And this is actually stored, if you want to think of it in the concept of tables, we have like a person table and there will be a dog table and there will actually be a link between them. So a dog may have an owner, a, a person may have a list of dogs and you can actually traverse down into that. Now, if we want to query those relationships, we can actually do that inside of Realm as well. And those are our relationship queries. We call these link queries in the documentation. And so let's take, for example, we have the person object and we have the dog object there. And just as we've seen before, and if we want to query them, we can do something like this. So again, we're going to get back to Realm results. So uh, that's going to be uh, user. You can actually say list of user if you wanted to, and it'd be completely fine. It would compile. You're just going to miss some of the goodness that we're going to talk about here in a minute. And what we can do is we actually provide the relationship query inside of the equal to method here. So we say find all the users whose dog's name is equal to Fluffy. And what that will do is it'll give me all the users back that have dog's name Fluffy. And you can work with them, whatever. There's a lot of other advanced uh, link queries that you can do. You can start chaining different ones together. Uh, you can get, we could probably have a whole talk just about that and the implementation of it. If you're interested, check out this link here, bit.ly uh, realm hyphen relationships has tons of good information. Uh, quick note, if you did download the slides already, uh, I will be providing a new copy of the slides as I did change them last minute this morning when I went to a rehearsal and found it did not flow correctly, so I had to move a few things around. So uh, I will provide a new slides to the conference staff shortly. So real quick, where do we get Realm? Um, you can just go to realm.io and you can actually download it. There is installation instructions and so forth at, at realm.io. Um, one of the big questions here is how much does Realm cost? Realm is actually 100% free to use. Uh, all products are open source, so the platform bindings, meaning Android, iOS, React Native, and the other ones that are being worked on are completely free and open source. So if you see a bug, you can actually go in there and uh, submit a pull request. Now that doesn't mean that they're only supported by the community. Realm is actually a company. They do have headquarters. Uh, they are funded. Um, what does that mean? Does that mean that they're going to charge you eventually? No, Realm does make money from various other companies, large companies that use them and need support. So they do make money in that regard. But to use it for your own applications uh, in production, completely free, uh, the licenses are all right there. Now, the only thing here is all of the products are open source, but the underlying core database is still private. That is planned to be open source at a later time. They're just going through the, the final rounds, cleaning stuff up, implementing the last few features. Uh, and then they plan to open up the, the core database at a later time. Now, if, if for Android, if you want to set this up, uh, this used to be just a simple build.gradle dependency. Uh, it's changed a little bit now. If you're familiar with, with Android, you'll know that we, have, we use the Gradle build system. There's a couple of build files inside of a typical Android application. So what we need to do is inside of the root build.gradle, we need to add a Realm Gradle plugin to the class path. We now use a Gradle plugin to build Realm, and I'll tell you why in a second. And then in your applications, build.gradle file, you just apply the plugin just like the Android plugin is applied, very similar. And at that point, all you really need to do is extend Realm object like I showed you, and you're good to go. So uh, why is that done that way? Uh, mainly because previously we just used a regular uh, dependency. Uh, now we've changed it to use the Gradle plugin mainly because now we can do some crazy bytecode weaving and we can remove a lot of the crazy uh, requirements that we had on the actual objects. Previously, you couldn't put custom logic in your getters and setters. You couldn't extend interfaces. You couldn't do anything like that. Implementing this new method, which just came out recently, allows you to put custom logic in your getters and setters, allows you to do all these different things that have been requested for a long time. So uh, why use it? Well, back in April of last year, I found Realm. Was it last year? Yeah, last year, April, uh, I found Realm and when I first saw it, uh, the first thing, this was like literally me immediately because I was working on a large SDK where I had to write SQL every single day and it was driving me nuts on a mobile platform. Um, but seriously, the, I get to work with objects and this is, you know, I don't see anything that makes it complicated. Uh, and it was super fast. That's the big reason for me is just recently, last week, a startup in New York City came to me and said, hey, Don, we need to get our Android app up and running. We had it previously, it fell behind. We had to take it off the Play Store. It's just, it's not working. Uh, we have the iOS version. Can you make the Android version? I went and took a look at it. It was a lot of data stuff going on. Uh, and I actually said, yeah, I'll do it. And 
as long as I can use the tools that I want to use. And so I came in, ripped all the data stuff out, implemented Realm, uh, and was able to just to focus directly on solving the business problem instead of worrying about how I'm going to shift bits back and forth to a database. So it allowed me to work really fast and allowed me to not have to write SQL, deal with any of that, but that wasn't it though. That's just not the, the sole purpose. Realm actually has uh, a lot more power. And what that means is, is Realm by itself, the way it's built is actually built to allow reactive programming. So I first saw this last year, about April 2014, I used it, I don't know, close to probably November of this year. Even after I was consulting with Realm, I didn't know that the query results were auto-updating, and we'll talk about that in a second. And when I saw this, it had one of those moments where you see that GIF where the guy's head kind of explodes. That was kind of the reaction that I had. Uh, so let me show you what I mean here. Uh, query results automatically update. And so what that means is if you have a field inside of your class and you've queried for it at some point, if something else happens to that same object in the database later on, and you're, maybe that screen is still up, and that object gets updated, that object in your field will automatically be updated. So you can just react to those changes. So here's an example. Let's say we have a dog here, uh, and we're gonna find where the dog's uh, equal, ID is equal to one, two, three. We wanna find the first one that comes back. Now what we can do is we can register something called a change listener on that object. So this is a Realm object. I can add a change listener. And basically what happens is it will get called as soon as the query is complete. Uh, and then each time the object is updated. Now let's assume that you have a screen that's up and running uh, and you're looking at this object on the screen, whatever, and a push notification comes in on your application. And the push notification starts a background service to go fetch some data to update the database. And that's what's happening right here. This is happening in the background thread. Now what happens is, well, it goes and finds, hey, I need to update this dog because the push notification said it was out of date. So it finds a dog, does a transaction, updates the age to age 12 for whatever reason, commit the transaction. This is on a completely different thread. I'm looking at the screen. It's often a background chunk in a way. Immediately, as soon as commit transaction is called on the next iteration of the Android run loop, the on change method will be called. Just letting you know, hey, by the way, uh, that D1 object you have, it's already up to date. There's, it's been changed. Go ahead and do something with it. So now you can actually know in real time and react to those changes to your application. Now, that's just not limited to individual objects. That's limited, you know, you can also do the same thing for a large list, such as uh, Realm Results of T. Now, this is real, it's really powerful because if you're building some type of application where you need to query for something. We've maybe asked the Realm database here for all the puppies here that are, you know, dogs less than the age of two. The same thing, because we're using Realm Results, again, it's just a list of T, but we're gonna, since it's Realm Results, we can add a change listener saying, hey, any time, any object is affected by this query, if anything's added, removed, anything like that, go ahead and call this change listener. And so what we're gonna do here again in some other thread, in the background thread, we'll go ahead and maybe we say this time, all right, well, I'm gonna create a new dog. A new dog has come down from the API. I'm gonna add it to the database. Set the age to snoop, the age, the age to one, I mean the name to snoop, the age to one, commit it. Immediately at the next iteration in the run loop, this will get called. And if we had two puppies in our database before, this gets executed, all of a sudden puppies has already been updated and has three items in there. And so you can actually start responding to changes in real time to your application as things are happening in different threads without having to set all these different watches and so forth all over the place. Finally, so we can watch individual objects, we can watch the results of our queries for individual objects and large lists or you know, small lists. Uh, we can also watch an entire, watch the entire database saying, hey, anytime anything changes in the database, you know, somebody's name changes, an object's added, removed, deleted, whatever, go ahead and let me know. And this could be very useful if you have various different, uh, if you're using it as a cache, so you just have one object that's inside of your Realm database and you want to use it as a cache, and anytime it's updated, you want to perform some action like invalidating, updating subscribers, or anything like that, you could do it here. Speaking of which, you're not required to just have one Realm database. You can have multiple Realm databases running at any time. So you can just configure it, saying, I like to have this Realm database named Don.Realm, this other one called John.Realm, and, and so forth. So you can have many different of them. Uh, and you can watch the entire Realm. Usually, immediately at this point, the question comes up, can we have fine-grained listeners? Like, I wanna know when the dog's, dog's age changes. Can you notify me of only that change? Not at this time. This is currently being worked on, and it is a feature request, but they are working at it right now. This one is kind of out of left field, but it's very important because it's super easy to set up uh, with security being a huge thing in the world these days. People want their data to be secure. 
uh, and they want to make sure that uh, it's not easy to steal. Out of the box, Realm supports AES-256 encryption, so it makes it pretty easy. All you have to do is provide a key, and then when you build your Realm instance, right here, you can say, all right, here's the configuration for it, set the encryption key, and now when you call realm.getinstance, the entire database is encrypted. So if you were to pull that file off the database, it's just pretty much garbled. Uh, you can't tell what's in it. No, so how you want to provide the key, it's various different ways. You can build the key. Maybe it comes from an API endpoint that, uh, or some type of hash you've built uh, that maybe nobody could get to even if they decompiled your app. Uh, so that is one very powerful thing. So if you need a lot of security on your database, that's pretty much as simple as it gets right there. Is anyone here familiar with Realm and Android at all before this talk? Okay, a couple people. So for those that are familiar, you may have heard some of the issues around, well, Realm looks really awesome, but what about multi-threading? Uh, I hear there's problems with threading. This is in the Realm documentation here, uh, and I'm kind of just going to read the beginning sentence here. And the only limitation that you are going to run into with Realm is that you can't randomly pass Realm objects between threads. You've probably seen this happen like in the asynchronous task, you have, you want to, re you query for something in a database, the ORM that you may be using for SQL returns you back an object. You can pass that across a uh, thread boundary so it's returning to you on post execute. You can't do that in Realm. Uh, and that's because of Realm's, the way Realm was built with its architecture. Um, and the reason is, um, they made a lot of threading decisions to help speed things up inside of the application to make sure that you're not passing things between threads. Uh, and this is the real, real takeaway here is it, and I'm probably just going to read this line for line here, is it makes it effortless to work with these data on multiple threads without having to worry about consistency or performance. And that's because all those objects that we have that we just talked about are all auto updating. So if you've attached change listeners, um, you can go ahead and be uh, notified of these changes. So how do you normally pass things between threads? If you have an activity and you want to go to another activity or different things like that or start a service, you're just going to take the ID of something, take that primary key value and put it in the intent and pass it over. Realm is very fast and querying is, is insanely fast. We'll get to why that is here very shortly. And it's super easy to do that. And then you can actually work with those different objects and different threads. And because it's reactive and because you're gonna to change listeners, you can then be notified, hey, this object was now updated in the background thread and so forth. So it is a small price to pay to change the way you think about things a little bit, uh, but it does work. And it kind of goes back to this, this statement here by Edward Lee, who's a PhD at Berkeley. Uh, and this is perfect here. It says, you know, non-trivial multi-threaded programs are incomprehensible to humans, which if anyone who's ever worked in a multi-threaded application, not just like one or two threads, but you have multiple threads going, immediately your mind is just like, you can't keep track of like, all right, what's this object doing and this one? Okay, how do I make sure this one doesn't get updated or get ahead of this one or get behind this one? Uh, it's just very, very difficult and, our, and there's too many components and, and variables at play to really map our head around it. And so Realm is trying to solve all those problems of saying, hey, don't worry about the multi-threading, just only one rule, don't pass our objects between threads, we'll handle all the rest. But let's say that, you know, there's always been the argument, well, you can solve that. Sure, you can solve passing things between threads and make sure they're thread safe, and that's usually implemented with some type of locks. Um, but when you start implementing locks, you end up finding that you need a lock on the read, you need a, a lock on the right, then all of a sudden you're locking everything all over the place anytime you access that database and then immediately everything slows down because this thread is blocked because this one is writing and reading and so forth. So the end problem is really is that locks are slow. So there are some threading options uh, for Realm. Um, so the first one is you can operate on Android's main thread. Uh, and as, a, as a footnote said here, yes, it's possible. Uh, but a lot of Android developers really get the heebie-jeebies about it. Uh, Google has done a really good job of advocating don't do anything on the main thread because you will slow it down. Uh, because of the way Realm is architected, you could technically do it on the main thread. I have, a lot of people have, um, but it's one of those big things where no one likes to do it. So the secondary thing is to use the asynchronous API, which is where everything is done in the background thread and they shuffle things for you behind the scenes. And this is an example of the asynchronous API here. Now notice how the first line here, we're just gonna query all the dogs in the database. We have find all, and the only thing that's different here is this async. So any of the operators that you have, like find first, find all, etc., you can attach the async word at the end of it, and now it turns into an asynchronous call. But now something a little bit different happens. I'm gonna fire off that first line. Immediately what's gonna happen is I'm just gonna get back a list, an empty list of realm result of type dog has no items in it whatsoever, just 
it fires off, returns back an empty list so I don't get no pointer exceptions. It says, okay, what you need to do at that point is attach a change listener. And that will be called as soon as the query is complete. And then at that point, you can then go ahead and check, all right, now I have 10 dogs, I need to do something to the screen and update it. And so that happens in the background thread for you. <clears throat> and so that happens with the Realm, res realm results uh, for a, a list. If you wanna do that for an individual object, so you just do find first async. So I wanna find the first dog who's uh, has the age of two, and the same thing, you know, same paradigm happens here. It will return you back a dog, and then you wanna make sure that here you update your screen or whatever you're working with at that point in time. Here's another asynchronous example here. We have uh, the list of dogs here. We're gonna find them all. Uh, as you see, the puppy size is equal to zero. There's no puppies in the database. Uh, we can go ahead and query an asynchronously in, a, in another thread. Uh, we may wanna execute some type of transaction. So what we're gonna say here is we're gonna create a dog in a transaction. Well, so we're now creating asynchronous transaction. We're asynchronously writing to the database in another thread. We'll create that dog, we'll set the age three, commit transaction is called for us as well. And then we have a callback here for it was success. And then we can actually see puppies.size has now been incremented to one because everything is auto updating. Those results like we see before have been auto updated. There is another callback I did not include in here because of the size of the screen. There's actually an on error callback. So if anything happened inside of the execute, the on error would be called, which is something you should definitely implement because otherwise you get some weird errors. You don't know what's happening. So what about RxJava? RxJava is a huge thing in the Android community. Almost everybody uses it, it seems like. Uh, is it supported? Yes, uh, as of the last couple of months, RxJava support has been released. Uh, this is an example from this example application here written by one of the developers on the Realm team. That's about, and what it does is it basically goes out to, uh, finds all the users in the Realm database, and then using RxJava goes out to GitHub, and that's where this line right here, api.user, goes out to GitHub and gets some stats about that username and then returns it back. So if you wanna learn more about the RxJava support that is supported inside of uh, Realm, please check it out here. The thing to notice though, is we're using find all asynchronously. So find me all the objects asynchronously, return it back as an observable, that's an RxJava observable. And at that point, then I can start doing filters and maps and so forth. And you'll see the next line immediately is filter persons dot is loaded, is loaded is a method on the Realm results, meaning say, hey, has this query basically returned? Has it been loaded? And as you know with RxJava, if it's false, nothing else we're gonna go into, gonna get executed. Uh, and as soon as it's loaded, boom, everything after that will get executed. So back to the topic before, I heard that we can use Realm on the main thread. Is it possible and should I? Uh, possible, yes. My advice, use the asynchronous API. It's just gonna cause less problems. You may understand the internals of a realm, uh, especially if you're working on a team or even as a consultant, you may get to the point where you have to deliver the application to someone else. If they see something on the main thread, they may freak out uh, because they don't understand the internals of how realm was able to work. So just use the asynchronous API, tack on async on everything at the end. It does change the way you have to write your application a little bit because it's more reactive. So you have to just kind of fire and forget and say, let me know when you're done. Uh, but it does work and I've used it in production apps with RxJava too with success and it's helped me very much. So why is it possible though to run on Android's main thread? The main reason is because Realm is super fast the way that it's built. Again, it's from the ground up, uh, no existing decisions were made. The original founders of Realm are from Nokia. And so they really dealt back in the day, remember the small little phones we'd all have in our pockets that were like the size of a cracker. Um, they're the guys who built up and worked on all those. And so they ran into a bunch of limitations with things you could do on databases. So they've seen like kind of the worst of the worst and decided to solve it and kind of help build Realm because of that. So let's talk a little bit about how Realm is built to handle all these different types of things. So Realm is actually a MVCC database and that's multi-version concurrency control database. This is a simple tree diagram. Under the hood, Realm is basically a tree. Uh, of course, that's an abstraction, but you can think of it that way. We have a current version of our database, V1. This is where our database is right now. For some reason, we need to make a change to that C object there. And we say, all right, well, that C node needs to get changed. That could be a dog object, whatever. So, all right, I need to change it. What ends up happening is a copy on write behavior happens. Say, so, all right, well, I'm gonna take this tree and I'm gonna go ahead and anything that's changed, I'm gonna kind of copy it over. And since that tree has been affected all the way up to the root R there, we copy it over and those are the green ones. It's kind of hard to see on this projector, but that's RAC in those, those green bubbles there. 
And then what happens is those point to the other B and D. We make the change to C, and as soon as it's been committed, uh, Realms database, the internals of it says, all right, well, are there any tra other transactions? Is everything good? Is everything, everything fine? Okay, there's no errors, good. I'm now gonna advance the, basically the pointer inside of Realm saying, hey, this is the most recent version of the database is this new version right here. That's the new version. And then what it does, it takes the old objects, the R, A, and the C, and just drops them into some garbage to get cleaned up uh, as soon as it can next. So that's kind of the, the high level architecture there of how it's architected under the hood. One of the reasons why it's so fast is because it implements a zero copy architecture. And let's talk about that for a second. ORMs move data around in memory. And I'm not saying ORMs are bad at all. Uh, I love ORMs. For example, I do a lot of Rails development. I love Active Record. I couldn't live without it. Uh, but it does take uh, time and memory, and that's very expensive on mobile devices. There's ways to get around it. You can be very careful and so forth. Um, but what ends up happening with ORMs is data gets taken out of the database, gets put into like cursors, gets put into uh, then has to be mapped into different objects, and then it has to be mapped into lists, and then relationships happen, and that can ha happen recursively. It just gets expensive, and then furthermore, the data is actually, if you have a query and a list of objects, this data is actually disconnected from the database. So the database can be changing underneath you, and you don't know. Yes, you can attach content observers if you're using Android and watch the database. It's super cumbersome, uh, but it does work. Um, long story short, uh, they just move around a lot of memory. There's a lot of stuff stored in memory because we now have this object down here in the database. We had to read it into the query. We had to put it into the objects and shuffle that data around. Realm's different. Realm's database file is memory mapped, meaning that the whole file in memory is mapped in the same format that it is on the disk. That's usually when the crowd looks like this. Um, so what that basically means is that you're talking directly to the database at all times, not an abstraction. So, Anytime I am looking at my person object and that person has a bunch of dogs, or maybe it just has one dog even, I say, hey, I want to go get that the first dog object. What happens immediately is Realm goes up and says, all right, well, you want access to that? No problem. I know exactly where that's at on the database. I'm just going to go ahead. It's all memory maps. I'm just going to go ahead and give it right back to you. This is the reason why it can be completely reactive. So anything that changes, we already know where the data is at on the disk and everything's just kind of, it's just like a direct pointer directly to the data on the disk. And as it changes, we can just get notified. Uh, you can't do that with an ORM. It's sitting in a different database engine somewhere and there's not those, not that available hooks and so forth. So that's kind of the high level view of, and of the architecture. So let's talk a, bit, a little bit about um, migrations. You've built your application, you're using Realm, you, you like it and so forth, a new feature requirement comes down, you have to add a new object. How do you do that? You can use migrations. This is a Realm migration and we actually uh, just basically say we're going to get the schema of a Realm here up top as soon as we have the migration method here, migrate. And we can check the version. Again, you can kind of just increment the version. We've kind of seen this before in many other uh, migration type libraries. The old version was version zero. What we need to do now is we want to add a new person. There's been a new requirement, add a person object to this application, or to Realm, excuse me, because the person object's needed in the application. We're going to add a field, it's called ID, it's of type long, and we want to make this a primary key. And we want to add a field name, and I want to add a field age. You can add different things like required, all different kinds of stuff here. This tells Realm, hey, when you start up next, go ahead and make sure that you use this migration to make sure that the database is at the correct location. This right here just tells Realm about the new object so Realm can kind of create that table inside of itself. You also need to create the person.java file, but I'm not gonna to explain to you how to create a Java file. Very easy, you know, public class person with your ID, name, and age, uh, and extend Realm object, and that's it. And so you can add, you can remove, you can change fields, you can drop fields, all different kinds of stuff like that and move things around inside of Realm. And you have access to the Realm here. Now, something interesting here is we have, you see something up here we haven't seen before, dynamic realm. Now, we went back, remember the query modifiers like and and or and find all? Well, there's also something known as a dynamic realm, which you can use, as, say you're building an application, like a finance application, and you need to be able to provide reporting on that application. You want someone to be able to select, I want this field and this field and this field, and I want to or them together, and I'll provide these values. Well, you're basically building a report builder, and that happens in applications. So you can actually use a dynamic realm in that case, which opens your current object, and you can actually build these queries dynamically together so you don't have to have everything statically typed. So if you need that functionality of dynamic, you can use a dynamic realm. I'm not gonna get into more of the dynamic stuff here because it could be a whole ball of wax to get into, but if that's what you need, that support is available. And here's how you can 
again, add and change things in a database. All right, so the Realm browser, this is kind of cool. It's only on OS X now, uh, but other platforms are planned. Um, this is the Realm browser running in OS X here. We have an owner object, which you know, would be the person object and what we were just talking about. And we have a dog. The dog is highlighted here. These are all the dogs in the database. Uh, again, this is a Boolean field saying the dog has been vaccinated. And then we can actually see who the owner is. And it's actually a link. And this is just an OS X application. You can click on that and then it'll open the actual owner. So if I click on Emily, it'll go straight to Emily. And then it'll actually have a link to her dog, Pickles McPorkchop, uh, on, on that screen. Now, it's very limited what it can do. It's kind of nice because you, you, you do have to copy the file off the device and open it up in Realm, uh, in the Realm browser. But here's one of the really cool, powerful things here that you can do with it. Uh, let's say you've, you know, and this would never happen, someone's built an iOS app and then someone needs to build an Android app, right? So they say, all right, well, I, have, I want you to build the Android app. If they have used Realm and actually Objective-C in iOS, uh, Realm is actually pretty popular. If they you have used Realm, then what you can do is you can take their Realm file, open it up on, in the browser, and then there's a file option saying, all right, generate Java classes off of this. And so if you have 50 like, tables or 50 objects that are in here, it'll actually generate those 50 Realm object Java files for you, and you can just save those, and vice versa. If you've built the Android version first and you want to build an iOS version, you can go ahead and open the Realm file and generate the Objective-C Swift bindings and so forth. And so it saves a little bit of time. Um, I, think they're working on the React Native stuff in there as well, so you can generate those. But uh, again, I think there are other platforms being worked on at this time, but it's a nice little thing so you can come in here and poke around and see what the data looks like. I'll usually open it up when I'm first building my app to make sure everything looks correct. Uh, kind of hop in there and say, all right, well, I've wrote my app, I've loaded the data in, let me look to make sure I didn't miss anything and go from there. So what's coming, uh, we're removing, well, for what's coming is they're removing the requirement to extend Realm object. Just recently in version 0.88, you can now have the custom logic I was talking about in the getters and setters. That was not possible. It was a huge hangout for a lot of people. They couldn't put uh, the logic in their getters and setters. It just had to be like a real dumb pojo. Now you can put some logic in there. Uh, so they're working on the requirement to just remove the extension of Realm object. Hopefully that'll be coming now because of the greater plugin. There's a lot more power. Uh, there's better RX Java support being worked on for custom schedulers. Uh, right now there's no schedulers. We can say, hey, do this on a Realm thread or whatever. Uh, we just kind of have to work with Android's main thread and kind of work around a couple little small issues there, but it is supported. And of course, more platforms, more goodness. Uh, from what I hear, they're working on things like .NET and various other application platforms as well. Okay. If you do have feature requests, you've run into bugs, uh, you have comments or anything, you can go to Realm Java. This is where all the development, and if you want to go to, I think it's Realm, Objective-C and Realm Swift or whatever for these, those bindings, you can go there, report issues, uh, comment, et cetera. The teams are very active. If you report an issue right now, there'll probably be someone commenting on it within the hour. Uh, and they'll be evaluating helping you uh, fix it or identify if it is an actual bug and they'll be working on it and put it in the backlog. So it's very active. There's daily activity inside of each one of the repos on Realms, web, on Realms GitHub. So everything sounds good about Realm. So what's some of the not so good? Well, like I said, there's no custom Rx Java schedulers yet. Uh, there's no composite primary key support. So you can only have one, one primary key on your object. So if you need multiple to create that composite primary key, that is not supported yet. Uh, that is something they are evaluating and, and trying to implement. Uh, and finally, it does require kind of a significant paradigm shift. There's no passing objects between threads. We're very used to doing that in Java uh, inside of Android. If you can learn to just pass the IDs for these objects and requery in another thread, and if you're using abstractions like the single responsibility principle and putting things behind uh, abstractions where you can just query for data, then it shouldn't really be a big problem, uh, but it does require that paradigm shift. Furthermore, the uh, Realm results and the queries being auto-updating in that reactive nature does make you think a little bit differently. So who's using this on Android? Uh, there's quite a few companies that are using it at this time. So we got like Starbucks, Ship, IBM, Zappos, StubHub, Shop Savvy, a bunch of other ones. The list kind of goes on and on and on. Uh, so there are big companies that are using Realm in production at this time. Um, it's on hundreds of millions of devices at this, you know, Realm's actually running on hundred, hundreds of millions of devices, possibly even on apps you have on your phone now. Uh, and just like Android, these are the iOS companies that are using it. So Groupon, McDonald's, Zipcar, ZipRecruiter, even Oprah's using it. So uh, a lot of companies that are using it. So it does have real world use. It is being adopted by large companies. It is being adopted by startups. Uh, it's just something simple and easy to use. And I think we have the perfect amount of time for questions, if anyone has any questions.
Yes, sir. Oh, wait, hold on. Sorry, hold on one second. He's got a, he's got a mic. So if you're iterating a, a list of results on one thread and something on another thread changes an entry in that list or adds or removes, you know, how is that resolved? So if you have a change listener on, say, that, that Android main thread to be notified when something updates or vice versa, it's, you need to be, well, let me say this. If the auto-updating results only occur, will only work if anything that has an Andro on Android's main looper. So if it's on Android's main thread, you've attached a change listener, something's happening in the background, it will get notified on the next iteration of the Android's run loop. And if you're on the background thread, there's, you can also call it wait for update, and it will actually wait for an update on, the, on that thread itself. I guess what I'm thinking is if you're, if you're in mid for loop on the background thread mm -hmm. and something gets added on the main thread, is mm -hmm. that immediately going to change the, the contents of the for loop on the background thread? Not until the next iteration of the run loop, no. So no, it won't change it immediately. Okay. Yes. Why would you ever use multiple routes? Like, it was like a regular app. Why would I have multiple realms? That's like the same thing. Oh, sorry. I was, my question was, why would you ever have multiple realms for just a regular app? Mm -hmm. It's just like the UK case of why would you have multiple mobile databases, you know? Most likely you're probably not going to do it, yeah. but there may be that weird instance where you have multiple databases. Uh, for example, I was working on an SDK in the last couple of years where we had uh, products in one database, we had transactions in another just because that's the way it needed to be architected, and we had like six different databases, uh, and they would all talk to each other with a particular ID for that ID, uh, and that's the way that they want it architected. Another way I've seen is actually have the, the data for the database in one, which is just strictly for the actual app and its logic, and then it'll have like just, like I said, like a cache, and like these are the values or the user preferences, like it doesn't have to do anything with the data, like customers or anything. And this is just like the user preferences. So instead of storing it in like shared prefs or something like that, people might put it in there. It's all up to you. Like if you want to store it in XML, you can store it in XML, whatever <laughs> kind of works, you know? Thank you. Mm -hmm. If anybody does have any questions, uh, and I will be here, uh, feel free to come up and ask them. Uh, there are usually every single time, there are a few questions I cannot answer. Uh, and if that's the case, I will get your contact information and then I'll talk to the Realm team and I will get back to you with the answer. Um, so if you need any more clarification, please let me know. And thank you guys for coming.